longer show that will be out next week. And while filming that show, we had a call with Barry Habib. His segment was supposed to be part of this longer show. See, what had happened was he crushed it and we went long. So we're pivoting today and you'll get to see that segment first. It's a little odd because this interview picks up in the middle of a longer conversation. We were discussing financial COVID relief and how sometimes the end results don't match the original intentions. We throw to Barry for his thoughts on the matter as it pertains to the original margin call issue and the current forbearance issue. These are two great examples of well-intended programs with unintended consequences. Barry covers this really, really well, explains it beautifully, and then leaves us with some great news. Take a look. Barry, that's our first two examples of well-intended programs with maybe unintended consequences and results that didn't really match the original intentions. What are your thoughts on that? Because you've been instrumental in actually helping to fix both of those examples, forbearance and the original problem with the margin calls and the erratic MBS behavior. Thoughts on, on just the first two examples? Well, yeah, uh, Ronald Reagan said uh, the nine most dangerous words are um, from the government and I'm here to help. So to help. yeah, we're well-intentioned uh, uh, programs and uh, what the Fed did, let's start with that one first. Yeah, that was really scary. That that put us on the brink. I yes. don't think many people know how, how close we were to the, to the edge of uh, these margin calls really depleting the liquidity. Thank goodness that the uh, leadership was good and yeah, we were lucky. I got uh, a couple of Fed members, ex-Fed members, Fed economists that I was able to speak to. They're friends of mine. And uh, Kaplan, we got in front of Kaplan right now, who's on the Fed. And then you talk, talk to uh, John Walden and Peter Bookfar. Everybody on the Fed reads Peter. Everybody I'll, in Congress. I'll interrupt you because you're being humble. We weren't lucky. We worked together. And you, you worked with uh, the right people to get that change because we were headed down a really bad path. And that were, there wasn't luck. There was strategy and a lot of hard work. And we thank you for that. Thank you, man. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Yeah, it was uh, it was it was wonderful to be able to uh, to you know spend a Sunday night till eleven o'clock with right. Steve Lee. Kind of showed him, and then and then that Monday morning when he when he broke the story, but he put the let the note out Sunday night. So over that weekend, Walden had gotten to him before I gotten to him. I got to some uh, to some Fed members, and uh, and then Leesman's story, and then Monday. Here, let me just show you real yeah. quick. So I think this is really great to kind of take a look at. Um, I've got my screen up here and, and you can see this is mortgage backed security trading. And I want to just for a minute here, let, let's go back just a tiny bit more on mortgage bonds and just kind of, you can see we're kind of on a nice trajectory up here. And I'm very proud, by the way, these are our rate locks. We did not issue a rate lock for the entire uh, 2020 until we hit this one here on March the 9th. I was so reading it, that yesterday, rereading it again, and I was impressed as well because that, that next day was, uh, you, you saved quite a, people, you know, quite a few people a lot of money. Yeah, but you know what, what's nice is on the way up, nobody was getting the need for pricing exception. Nobody was locking. And by the way, how nice is it? You don't have to do a 60 day lock. You can get better pricing, better time, not taxing your system. So it's understanding this is important. You can see we did a bunch of locks in here. But as mortgage bonds started to fall off, and this wasn't because of mortgage bonds week, this was because margin calls on stocks. Stocks were in the toilet here. And now people had to liquidate good stuff like gold, like mortgage bonds, like treasuries, and they started to sink. Well, the Fed started to panic here. They said, hey, we're going to go to zero um, on, the, on the Fed funds rate. We're going to bring up mortgage-backed security buying. And they did, and that was okay. But the next week, they broke out the bazooka. In one week, they bought $167 billion, and you had a whipsaw of over 600 basis points, and that caused the problem. Now, his, here's the day that Monday we got in front of the Fed, and since then, look what's happened since then. Just kind of beautiful, steady hand by the Fed. It's just amazing. It's just incredible to see this, okay? Just beautiful, flat. Now, we took a little bit of dip. This was a result of the announcement that we got to sell another $3 trillion to pay for some of these programs. Interesting, the 10-year Treasury went from 60 basis points, extraordinarily low, up, all the way up to 70 basis points. Yeah, yeah 70 basis points. But look what's happened in the last few days. We've been really kind of nice here. Just, just we're in between the 25 and the and the uh, and the 50-day moving average. I anticipate that's where we're going to be. But let me just show you a couple of things here, real quick. Uh, it's important to know how rate locks work. So how do we get into that? So uh, you all know and you've heard the term, but let's just do the mechanics very fast. At the time of lock, if the rate's four percent, uh, the company says we're going to lock. You say we're going to lock. Nobody's locked. That's just a promise to lock. You should. It shouldn't be a lock. It should be called a promise. Let's just say the promise was 100. Was the price okay? So now all of a sudden rates got worse and that same 4% cost you 98. Oh my God, that's bad for the company because they don't get to offload this till it's sold. That's when it's actually locked, when it's closed. And then they can say, okay, now we know what the deal is. But 
the lender would have lost 200 basis points here. That means for every $100 million in pipeline, they lose $2 million. Not fun. How do I avoid this? I'm a lender. I don't want to play this game. How do I avoid it? Well, you do something you've all heard of. It's called hedging. So what does a hedge mean? That means I want to protect myself from rates moving higher. So I go to a broker dealer and here's what happens. If I, if I take mortgage backed securities, I want to be able to make money when they go down, when they get worse, when rates go up, when mortgage bonds get worse, I want to profit so I can keep my promise to the customer. So I'm going to sell mortgage bonds short. What does that mean? If I think they're going to go down, I don't want to buy them. I want to sell them, but I don't own them. So what do I do? They borrow them from a broker dealer. So the broker dealer, a Wall Street firm, lends them the shares and they sell what they've been lent. And they sell it at 100. Now, the price drops to 98. That's actually a good thing because they're short these shares because they owe them to the broker dealer. So in order to cover their short, what they do is they have to buy them. That's why it's called the short position because you need the shares, so you're short. So I buy them back to cover my position, but now the price went down to 98. So hey, good for me. I made 200 basis points. Yay. I made 100 million for every 100 million in my pipeline. I gained $2 million. Yay. But before I celebrate, remember that on the actual transactions that are closing, I lost the same thing. But that's the whole idea. That's why it's called hedging because they offset each other. Now that's great. That should work fine. What's the problem, you might ask? Why were we all going out of business? Why? Well, because when rates go down or mortgage-backed securities improve or go up in price, same deal, 4%. It's at 100, a time of lock. At time of closing, it went to 102. I'm really happy about this. I love this. It's great. I gained 200 basis points. For every 100 million in pipe, I made an extra $2 million. You might say that's wonderful. But remember, I lost an offsetting amount in my short broker-dealer account. So I shorted it at 100. I sold it at 100. I got to buy it back at 102. So I lost 200. Again, they offset, except here's the deal. When we look at what happened in the marketplace, 600 basis points, you might say, okay, Barry, what's the difference? So now you're down $6 million that week for every 100 million. You should be making up that 600 million in pipeline, except there's a timing issue. I locked all those here. They're not going to close to here. The broker dealer wants their money here because they owe, I owe them the shares. They want to cover that short here. Give me my money. Give me it now. And they were writing checks for $50, $100 million. They didn't know that they can last another week. And that's why as an emergency, we pulled all our resources. We got in front of the Fed and the Fed realized what they were doing. They didn't want to hurt anybody. They just didn't know how the plumbing worked. So they stopped us. And that got us to here. So I just wanted to show that. Now, let's talk a little bit about, I've had discussions with Mark Calabria. I've ongoing talks with him. And, and, and the forbearance issue, as we know, it's very complex. It's, 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 a, it's tough, but the, the, the bright spots are this. Uh, HUD's got it kind of figured out because they have a pass-through payment assistance yes. plan. It can only be on a HUD loan or an FHA, uh, FHFA loan, so which that includes Fannie and Freddie. So it's Fannie, Freddie, uh, FHA, VA, and USDA. That's, what, that's the only ones that can apply for forbearance. It's possible at the end of this month, according to Calabria, that the window to initiate new transactions closes. And what have they done? You're supposed to advance the payments. And the way to look at forbearance is imagine, imagine an apartment building with tenants and you have a superintendent and an owner. And the owner says, yeah, you know, I don't want to collect the tenants. So I'm going to hire a superintendent. I'm going to hire somebody to go and wrangle up the rents. I'll pay them, you know, a blue collar salary or whatever, and they'll go out and they'll collect the rents. Except one stipulation, superintendent, if somebody doesn't pay, you got to advance me the money. And you go ahead and get it. Right. That's like a servicer is a superintendent. The tenants are the mortgage holders, yes. uh, mortgage uh, uh, borrowers, and the owner are the bondholders. So who are these bondholders? That's you. That's me. It's all of us. It's in your mutual funds, your IRAs, your 401ks, and the covenants that the co that payment's got to be made. Because otherwise, it would really destroy the whole financial confidence in the system. All the money that you have in your 401ks, IRAs, financial plans, things like that, that are loaded with these types of bonds. So when we take a look at this, what happens is that the servicer under forbearance has to has to try and collect the payments. They're not collecting them, but they still have to advance them. So HUD said, look, you could borrow the money. That helps. That was fine. But FHFA has been reluctant to do so. But then they came up and they said, okay, one thing, we're going to limit it to four payments. We'll cover the rest. And they say, here's an extra 500 bucks. So that maybe like three and a half payments. Yep. More manageable. But here's the good thing. Currently, you've got about 7% in FHFA loans, which is Fannie and Freddie that are in forbearance, and 12% of HUD loans. So the HUD loans, thank God, we got a mechanism for that. But of the 7%, do you know that 40% of those, 40% of those are making their payments even though they're in forbearance? That's really amazing. That's really amazing. 
which now leaves at about really a for forbearance rate of approximately 4.2% that are not making the payment that are in forbearance, 4.2% of all mortgages. Not terrible. I'm not good, right. but not terrible. Right. If we get the window to close, this will be manageable. So I'm very optimistic as to what's going on. And we were able to get Calabria to see a couple of things. He really, in my opinion, wants to help. Um, so he explained some things to me. Look, I, I'm guilty. I was very critical of him. And, and I think that things still could have been better. And I would hope that things could be better. But I was wrong in being as critical as I was. But as I began to learn some of the things in the you know, why he's got his hands tied behind his back on certain issues or the rationale on others, it became more apparent that, you know, this is not someone who's trying to be a demon here. It's someone who maybe doesn't have everything that he's done correctly and could have done a little better, but it's not like he's trying to hurt us here because uh, you know, he's got to run FHFA as well. That's so. actually kind of the point of the entire show. Like you're one of the smartest people I know, you know, Crystal Ball Award winner, like, you know, on TV, CNN, Fox, and even you are saying, man, I was I was a little bit critical. But also, man, things were flying at us quick. We were trying to solve problems. It's totally to be expected. But I think, as you said, like, I think it was a genuine case of people trying to help. But you got to remember, this is like during a pandemic. Let's roll out some relief. And guys, it wasn't necessarily perfect. These first two examples, thanks to Barry and, and some other advocates in FHFA and the feds that were listening, we were able to kind of get it fixed and smoothed out. But I think that's kind of the point of the of the show. You just said it like I they didn't get it necessarily right. I don't fault them. I don't know that I could have done a better job with the short amount of time during a pandemic either. I'm just happy that we all work together and with your leadership kind of fix both those examples. Thanks, brother. So listen, I, I, I know you got a long show today, but yep. what I'd like to do is let's come back. I want to go over some real estate fundamentals because they look really good to me. Awesome. I want to love go it. Mortgage fundamentals because they look incredibly good to me. You folks are in for the best ride ever. We just got to get through this patch. And I also want to talk with you about the equity markets. I know that you watched uh, David Rosenberg and I yesterday. Twice. And I think there's some revealing things that perhaps we could share with your audience and kind of maybe we'll do another show and we'll kind of talk about those aspects of it. So, very bullish on real estate, very bullish on low rates, a little concerned about the stock market. But overall, if you're in the mortgage industry, like those of you listening or real estate industry, you have a lot to be thankful for and a lot to look forward to. Love it. Can you share, sneak those in before we, before we, before we move on yeah, to our next three examples? Okay, so, so here we go. Let's pick a couple of things here just to kind of, you know, I'll, I'll do, I'll do um, if you'd like to, we, we kind of take a quick look maybe at, uh, well, let's see where we are here on, on some, of the, some of these slides. I'll just kind of pull some stuff up here. So look, with, with COVID, you know, we're, we're quarantined and this is going to cause one of two things that's been said. Some, some you know, people say jokingly, either you're going to get divorced or you're going to have more babies. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Both of those are very bullish for housing because you either have more household formations through divorce and babies. Number one reason why you want to purchase a home. Take a look at this here. Um, if you're 30 something, your home ownership rate without kids is 38% with one child. It's 80%. Wow. What do everybody want? What do they all want after COVID? What do you all want? I want a more distance. So that means a home. So you're going to see from urban yes. to suburban to exurban, you know, which is the next ring before rural. And then I want more space. So that's out of an apartment, out of a condo, into a single family residence. So I think you're going to see both of those are going to be high desire. And we did talk about babies. Search for baby registry. I don't know if this is just people staying at home and doing Google searches, but baby registry right now, highest it's ever been. So yes, maybe some of that, some of that's happening. And we've talked about this before is just the demographics. We'll go over that another time, uh, how important that is. This is all coming at a time with low inventory. And you know, your job market, your local job market, this is an easy one to see. Where are the high risk job markets? Where's the high risk? Well, obviously Las Vegas. Look, I've got a show in Las Vegas. I've got a show at Planet Hollywood, Chris right. Angel's Mind Freak, and we're sucking wind right now. Okay. I don't know if we're going to come back. So 35% of the jobs in Vegas are high risk. So that could have an impact in the long run on real estate. So you might say, well, we're still selling homes in Vegas. It's still good because it's so acute. We're talking weeks now. Okay. Mm -hmm. When, if this stretches out into an extended period of time, if it becomes quite pernicious, you have to say that the Vegas housing market may still be okay. But what this is telling you is the disproportionate impact of negativity on housing in that environment compared to the rest of the country. This is not a statement that Vegas is going to be bad. It's going to be good. This is just saying, that Vegas will struggle more in the housing market simply because we know that jobs are correlated to housing and they have a greater percentage of their jobs at high risk. Right. This is an easy one. Orlando, I like to highlight it because, you know, everybody could figure it Disney, okay? <laughs> so Shanghai just opened up, but only at 25% capacity. Maybe it gets better. Maybe we open up. Who knows? 
But what I'm trying to say is, is that if you're in Orlando, you have to be concerned that a good percentage of that economy is based on jobs from Disney. So you know, that can impact the housing market over the long period of time more than it would in San Jose, yep. in Washington, D.C. Makes sense. you could look at the area for where you are. Now, there's an offset to that. The offset of that is low-risk jobs. So do you have a lot of low-risk jobs? So let's go back to the previous slide. So high-risk, if you're in D.C., 17% high-risk. So on the lower end of the scale, low-risk jobs, lots of low-risk jobs. So you know what? You're in you're in good shape. So if we if we did that, that represents almost 50%, 40% of the jobs there, 39% of the jobs, which means the other 61% of the jobs are neither high-risk or low-risk. So you can have both in the same market. Gotcha. Now, for example, unfortunately, if you take a look at low-risk jobs in an area like Orlando, that's why this is kind of a little bit detrimental because you are on the spectrum here of not having as many low-risk jobs and a lot of high-risk jobs. So just interesting, interesting. stats here. Yeah. Uh, let, let's kind of leave it at that for right now because I know that there's so much that we can go over. And by the way, Google search homes for sale. Maybe these are people staying at home. But uh, but we believe the housing market is going to be exceptionally strong. And uh, and we'll, we'll take a look at those stock charts I went over with Rosie uh, on our next call, and as well as I've got a ton more stuff here that I could show you why the mortgage market's going to be so great, why you're going to be doing so much business. You know what? I'm going to leave you with one of them here. Yeah. Uh, by the way, just real quick, uh, as we head into this, will the housing negativity be mitigated? It will because vacancies are so low. And then when we take a look at the housing overview, uh, we see about a 1% or 2% drop, a 5% uh, increase in 2021. So there's going to be a big snapback. This is going to be a very good situation. I just want to go over this as the last one because I want to leave you with something important. This will show you what the future looks like for you mortgage professionals out there. And I want you to get ready to be happy. So the Urban Institute came up with numbers. And initially, they thought we'd do 650 in refinances this year. They said, oh, now it's going to be $1.3 And let's face it, team, you guys are busy. Now, no, look, I don't agree with all their numbers. We had much higher numbers. But they didn't. They thought rates were going to go up. I look at even the MBA's numbers. Unfortunately, the MBA, yeah. I don't agree with them a lot in this, their numbers. I know they're trying to do a good job. But I don't see it the way they see it. They see originations dropping like drastically next year. I, I, I for the life of me, can't understand that. You know, please do not listen to that information. You are going to do as a tremendous amount of volume next year because rates will be very, very low. Your refinance numbers uh, this year we're going to do 1.3 trillion, about a trillion in purchases, which drop because of the hit. And you're busy right now. I know you're busy. Yep. But team, look at this data. Rates right now, there's a lot of premiums. There's a premium for forbearance. There's a premium for elevated unemployment. There's a premium for capacity. So rates should be two and three quarters, two and five eighths on a 30 year fixed with zero. That's where the market is right now by measuring where mortgage backed security is. That's where we are. Except we've got these false add ons that have to be there because they're additional risk premiums. Those will start to come out, but rates will stay low. But even if they don't all come out, and even if you stay in this range of, let's just say, three and a quarter, three and a half, three percent in this band right here. And if you take a look and you say, let's eliminate all those with 20, I'll make it just those who have 20% equity. So it's a narrow number with a 720 FICO or better, a narrow number. And you know, you can do a 680 FICO, you can do a 90 LTV and they could save 75 basis points or three quarters of a percent by, by on a refinance. And you know, you could do somebody's refinance with a half a percent savings. So right. super, by the way, all these have to be in good standing. There's $4.8 trillion you could, re you can't even do 1.3 trillion. How yeah. are you going to do 4.8 trillion? So please, Stop complaining. Yeah, that's, please. It's enough for uh, a few years. <laughs> yeah, listen to me. I know because I've done loans for a long time. Ryan, you do loans. Yeah. It breaks your heart not to help somebody. Yes, we get aggravated. Ah, oh, non QM. I can't do I used to be able to do that loan. Oh, bond loan. <laughs> I, get, I get it. I get it. I get it. I'm with you. But don't focus on what you can't control and you can't do. Is $4.8 trillion of doable loans enough? I think so. Yes. Absolutely. Don't yes. do that. Guys, I know you want to help everybody, but when you get on an airplane, right, in the days we used to be able to do that, they drop the mask. They tell you, put yours on first. Fix yourself first before you help everybody else. Fix yourself. Do all kinds of volume. Change your personal life. Create your personal wealth. Do it right now. Heck, use our tool for debt consol, and yeah. you'll never have to worry about rates. Do refinances the way we show you because everybody else is calculating them wrong. I promise you, Ryan's seen it. No one knows how to do it. We'll show you how to do it correctly. These are the things you need to do right now and focus on use social 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 media because you literally have a captive audience don't do two hour presentations one minute presentations one point if you like something you learned from ryan for myself practice it write it down yes. take notes get to be expert on it and put it out there or use our social studio tool 
Bro, thank you, man. So much value, man. We have to, I want to go through that slide deck with you, and I'm sure you'll carve out some time for us. So we'll definitely have you back on the show because I'm looking through this the, the slide deck as you go through, and there's even more value packed into that. So I'll reach out to you next week. We'll try to have you back. I want to go through all of it, man. I appreciate it. You, once again, just crushed it in the short amount of time, and we really, really appreciate your time. I know you're busy, so we're going to move on to our next three points, but I know that makes a lot more sense, and that's why exactly why we pulled you in, man. Thank you, buddy. Thanks. Be well. Be well, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Again, guys, this was part of a bigger show that will be out next week. We left off with some great news. Next week's show could be a bit more controversial, though. Look for that next week. Comment, like, share this great news this week. In the meantime, see you guys next time.